deputy editor here at Defense One. Uh, and I am joined today um, by a, a very distinguished panel that I think is going to have a lot of good, in, a lot of interesting things to say. We've got Jeff Van Bemmel. He is with the Defense Information Systems Agency, or DISA. He's civilian deputy and the services directorate there. We have Christopher Whitaker. He is a digital service expert with the Defense Digital Service, or DDS. And we've got Stacey Pettijohn. She is Senior Fellow and Director of the Defense Program at Center for a New American Security. Welcome to everybody, and thank you for joining us. And once again, thank you to the audience for joining us. We will have Q&A at the end of, uh, audience Q&A at the end of our session. Uh, so please uh, get your questions ready, and you can even start submitting them right there in the, in the WebEx Q&A section. So, you know, queue those up, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Uh, for now, let's talk to our panelists. Um, everybody, thank you so much for joining me. Great to be here. Thanks for having us. All right. Uh, Jeff, let us start with you um, at, at DISO. In our prep call, you talked about uh, some of the things that you do, and 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 you, um, I think that DISO has a lot more varied missions and roles than I think many people understand. So why don't you, why don't you start by talking a little bit about just how DISO goes about its job? Yeah, thank you for having me today. I hope you can hear me okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I work for the services uh, directorate, which provides enterprise services, and um, we're really sort of leading um, the the defense department and the, the agencies move to cloud and um, and providing cloud services. We also manage all of the mobility services, um, traditional enterprise services like email. Uh, you know, that we help hosted on prem. We're now looking for cloud service providers like DOD 365 um, and we're helping with that migration. And, and so uh, it's really kind of an interesting time to be working in the agency. Great. Um, and I know that uh, you you talked a little bit about the fact that you're not just a provider, you're in some sense an advisor. Defense agencies will come to you and, and be at a loss for how to do what they do or how to take the next step. That's true. You know, particularly um, with cloud-based services, um, many customers are not sure if their application is ready for, for, for cloud or what they need to do to prepare it. Um, how do they virtualize it? What steps do they need to go through in migration? And similarly, when they move to commodity cloud-based services like Office 365, how do they integrate that with current on-prem applications or mobility? Um, and, and so we're, we help them not just with what offerings we have within DISA, but um, we have great connections with our defense uh, industrial-based partners and Amazon uh, and uh, Microsoft. And so, you know, we kind of put people together in a room and, and uh, you know, try to work through their problems together. What are what are some of the common problems that come? If, if you were to, to, you know, help people understand what they should know coming to this kind of meeting where they're going to figure out how to take their services into the cloud or figure out how to connect them to other agencies, you know, what kind of advice would you give them? Yeah, I think the first thing um, is a, an application that's installed in traditional hardware in a data center may not be cloud ready. And what does that mean by cloud ready? You know, so it depends on who your platform provider is, but um, you know, what sorts of third-party applications will they support? Or is your application virtualized? And getting an understanding too of how your application will be secured in that cloud environment. Um, you know, one of the great opportunities we've had over the years of moving inside of defense um, data centers is we had all these layers of protections. You move into an IO level five instance uh, cloud provider, and to some extent you, you have some protections, but you have more responsibilities as well. So we try to help them with the CSSP responsibilities and what accreditation pieces and how do you make that connection back? Um, you know, there's another, uh, another challenge when you move to a cloud provider is making sure that you have connection to data sources and to customers who, to, who interact with your application, making sure all of those um, inter, uh, interoperability requirements are met. Mm -hmm. And I think you hinted in there at, at one point about the, uh, uh, the notion that once upon a time we did it one way, now we're moving to a different way. And there are opportunities, but there are also risks. And part of what yes. I'd like to get into today with all three panelists is how one assesses those risks and how one goes about doing that. Uh, before we get to that, uh, let me go on to Christopher. And Christopher, tell us a little bit about DDS. I think you're the newest uh, newest agency in, of, of this group. Um, and I, I have this notion that you're kind of like the, the paratroops of, of defense IT. Here's a problem, let's jump in and save it. That's the way you think of it? Yeah, so we do do rapid response. Um, one of the 
so Defense Digital Service is comprised of highly technical nerds, uh, engineers, product managers, designers, data scientists, um, who have a background in both industry and government, um, as well as um, military uh, personnel who are detailed to us. And we do kind of three big things. Uh, the first being the, the rapid response role. So when the, the Theodore Roosevelt had the COVID breakout up on board ship, uh, DDS got a phone call to say, hey, we have a problem trying to, you know, triage who needs to get a COVID test. So we stood up my symptoms. Uh, we rolled that out very, very quickly. Um, the other two things that we do is uh, sort of phone and nerd services. So if somebody within the Department of Defense has a big technical problem they're trying to work through, they can call us. We'll either have a just a quick meeting with them or we'll do something called a discovery sprint when we'll bring a bunch of different perspectives on it, spend about two weeks sprinting uh, towards better understanding the problem. And then the third thing we do is we work to leapfrog the Department of Defense's capabilities. And a lot of that gets played out in our cybersecurity work, be it our uh, protective DNS service, our uh, counter UAS work. Um, and so it's um, more than just the rapid response, really trying to focus on force protection, secure systems, and in addition to our rapid response role. Got it. Okay. Um, and and Stacy, you uh, are at CNAS now. You would spent a lot of time at Rand as as an analyst there as well. Uh, and so you you have you bring deep expertise, and but maybe also kind of an outsider's perspective to the things that, that Christopher and and Jeff are doing. Gosh, you'd think I'd get over those party fouls at this point. Um, Yes, absolutely. Outsider perspective and an operational perspective. Um, a lot of my work has been on wargaming and so been looking at how the department and the services are attempting to build new operational concepts. And all of this is driven uh, really by the recognition and the desire to more quickly share information and to connect different weapon systems and platforms together. So you have a whole um, alphabet soup of acronyms of new operating concepts, whether it's joint all domain command and control for the Air Force or um, multi domain operations for the Army. Uh, and they are all attempting to connect sensors and shooters in an agnostic way and to share information among them so that they can have a common operating picture and more quickly close kill chains, basically destroy enemy targets. And all of this is premised on them being able to pass the information that they need to share it and see the same thing, have a, have a common operating picture and then converge the facts and doing so really, really quickly. So they're expecting to be using um, a software that helps them to make better decisions more quickly with machine learning and um, AI. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. A lot of good stuff to chew on in there. Let's uh, let's start with the idea that let's start with where the rubber meets the road, or or you know the tip of the spear, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all these things that that the services are trying to do to tighten the kill chain. Um, some of it's technical, of course. Out there on the battlefield, you have you know you, you don't have Ethernet you know following every missile battery around. You've got to you've got to work through uh, more difficult uh, technical situations. But you also have uh, risk. You have you know you have risk in connecting disparate systems. You've got risk in sharing what can often be classified information. You've got the risk that somebody is going to be listening in. Uh, everything is everything is, has risk and uh, and getting past that risk. I think is one of the big challenges of defense IT. Everybody's been doing it a certain way, and everybody's been, you know, the, the incentives have been there to be safe. And now, in order to re realize some of these opportunities, people have to get comfortable with, you know, not being quite so safe anymore. Let's talk a little bit about uh, about how you get past um, uh, that, 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 that feeling of safety in the way we've done things for so long. Yeah, that's true. You know, it's it's interesting. For the longest time, we had sort of this castle defense mentality. If you were inside of the Doden, the Doden had layers and layers of security inside of a data center. You were sort of three or four layers down. Um, and, you know, as we move into a more cloud-based world and a more mobile world, there's a lot more information that goes in and out of the Doden uh, onto mobile devices. It's portable. 
Um, and so, you know, I think one of the challenges our customers are having is understanding where their data sits and, and how it goes back and forth, making those connections and then securing those connections. I think that's one of the big challenges we have today. And, you know, I think we've got great partners in um, folks like Amazon and Microsoft um, who are bringing tool sets to bear and, you know, are working with us to develop the first IL-5 instance and the first IL-6 instance of these commercial products that they used to, you know, only sell at this sort of a, at a more commercial market level of security. So how do you, how do you tell people, Hey, look, there's great stuff over there. Go use it. No, I really can't do that. I mean, there's, there's a culture <laughs> thing here, Christopher, maybe you're, I see you're nodding. Yeah, I, one of the things that we run into a lot is the the process to procure technology, uh, not only in the Department of Defense, but all, all across federal and, and state and local government is, is just bad. And particularly when it comes to technology procurement with sort of security in mind, we have these complicated process to acquire and build the software. We have these compliance checklists we have to, to go through that may or may not even really hit all the different things we needed to. Um, ideally, we'd start moving towards a more flexible framework and start including some more of this vulnerability testing into the design and acquisition phase of software procurement. Um, one of my favorite things at, at, uh, at DDS is our Hack the Pentagon program in which we take a system either from the Army, from the Air Force, bring on security researchers, have them go to town in a a scoped, planned, safe way, expose critical vulnerabilities, which we then patch, so that we are we are safer. And the only way we really, and one of the real surefire ways of making sure that we've caught all these vulnerabilities is to actually red team them, and have them tested against real world researchers. Yes, yeah, Stacey, you want to you want to go take take off from there. Yeah, and I mean, certainly um, being ensuring that your data is secure is one piece of it. Um, the other piece, though, is just sort of the technical challenges associated with going from systems that are incredibly siloed um, with different uh, different types of data where there's no sort of standard for uh, the data and how it's managed, how it's stored, and, and common architecture. Um, so there there is a great desire at least in the part of most of the services right now to make these changes and they're impeded by actually really pragmatic considerations that involve you know data migration takes a really long time and is hard and needs to be done carefully to ensure that the data isn't corrupted and that it's uh, it's correct um, because all of this rests upon you actually having the right data in the right place at the right time and that it's secure. So this isn't even beginning to touch on the fact that um, you're planning to use some of these cloud architectures that um, the department is seeking to build and field like the Air Force's um, advanced battle management system, which is a a family and ecosystem of software um, in a conflict. So in an environment where someone's trying to actually uh, disrupt your operations and degrade it. So that that adds on a whole nother layer of um, difficulty. Right. Um, and, and and there's a there's a tension here because uh, you want to use all the the new capabilities that this connected IT stuff can give you. And yet, uh, what if you get too dependent on it? I mean, you know, famously, the Navy has started teaching some of his bridge officers sextants because you can't rely on GPS all the time because it's so easily spoofed. You know, this sort of thing. <laughs> you know, this sort of thing applies across the surfaces. You got this great technical ability, and then, but the enemy gets a vote. And how do you deal with that? How do you make those choices? How do you plan for backup? You know, I think Christopher hit on a key point, um, tight partnership with industry through bug bounty programs like Hack the Pentagon, uh, vulnerability disclosure programs. Um, we, we, we realize that um, the consumption of COTS, uh, commercial software and commercial services brings some risk. Um, but quite frankly, you know, in a government uh, software only world or a government legacy uh, system world, we had different risks. You know, we, we, we um, had uh, open source software and various other things that, and it was, it was hard uh, to code it and to make changes to it. 
Um, so moving in, in partnership with industry, I think really helps both of us get secure. Um, and um, I think that's really kind of the, a, a growing relationship as we go through this evolution to, to sort of a more cloud-based community. You've got you've to stay in close partnership with those guys. Right. So Christopher alluded to uh, the need to to work a little bit faster in in um, in acquiring software. Uh, you know, clearly, if our enemies are, are moving at commercial speed and our, our military is moving at you know some sort of hybrid, you know, updated military speed, we're going to fall further and further behind. What's DISA doing uh, in the attempt to speed up the acquisition or the iteration of of defense software? Um, it's largely through um, BPAs. Instead of having every everyone in the department going out and acquiring, um, you know, in, individual uh, contracts, we try to do one large contract that everyone can take advantage of. Dios, uh, the Dios contract is a good example of that. Y you want commodity Office 365 or support services, uh, migration support services from Microsoft, those kinds of things. Um, you can come to DISA, leverage those BPAs. We have similar types of things for for mobile equipment and and other cloud services, cloud credits to Amazon, um, and and so I mean I think the acquisition process has greatly improved over the 20 years I've been working in the DoD. It's getting better, um, and and I think largely that is because we have begun to understand industry and and um, close that that gap a lot between how the Defense Department does business and industry does business. But um, I, I think, you know, one of the great things that DISA does for the DOD community writ large is that acquisition piece. Like if you look at a large portion of our portfolio, it is in the acquisition support for everything from circuits through, you know, the cloud-based based, uh, mm -hmm. services today. Yeah, I don't think anybody would deny that things have gotten better over the past 20 years. Um, yeah. Stacy, are they getting better fast enough? Um, I mean, they're getting better. I think there's still room for improvement. Um, and what you're finding is that there's been a lot of emphasis on finding ways to bring in um, technologies and software from outside of the traditional DOD sort of ecosystem. But at the same time, um, these have been small contracts and they've had difficulty getting over what they call the valley of death, where they move and are adopted at scale um, so that the widespread production and acquisition of these um, needs to happen. And then you need to get into the updating to make sure that the systems are secure. You saw that the Air Force recently, um, for the first time, updated a plane software in flight, and it was the U-2, which is one of its oldest aircraft, which was kind of interesting in and of itself. But um, the need to continue to improve um, the innovation sort of acquisition system and make it even faster because um, because we're playing a, cat of, a game of cat and mouse with adversaries as well who are trying to penetrate these different systems, um, we need to be able to respond to that very quickly and, and move and working on year or two year sort of acquisition timelines is just simply too slow. Mm -hmm. I see Christopher nodding his head vigorously over there. Definitely, the the idea that that we're going to spend two or three years acquiring software is like an internet time. It's it's a very long time, um, and one of the eighteen um, F, which is a, a part of the GSA's technology transformation service, has actually done a really good job about putting out a lot of information and guidebooks and advice on speeding up acquisitions, including trying to do more modular contracting to where instead of getting this really giant, huge contract that can't possibly fail because it's just too big, and instead shrinking it down to doing little contracts at a time to slowly build up a service so that if you buy something and it screws up terribly, you're only out a little bit of money, not in time, not a completely huge project. Um, so that's that's one of the things that I want to tip my hat to is is 18F's work on that part. So tell me, is is there a gap between the BPAs that uh, that Jeff mentioned and these these smaller uh, projects that Christopher is talking about from 18F? Uh, Chris, are the are the BPA do they allow a, a smaller structure within this, or are they still kind of those the, the big the big purchases that uh, that we're trying to do better with? 
Um, can you confirm what you mean by BPA? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Maybe I misheard, misheard the acronym. Uh, Jeff, you were talking about uh, uh, contract vehicles that allow um, the DISA to set it up and then smaller agencies to go in and actually acquire the services that they need. Right. And I just wonder whether that is getting to, uh, you know, the, the sort of thing that Christopher's talking about. Yeah, a blanket purchase agreement. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I'll tell you one of the things, and I'll let Chris jump in on it as well. Um, you know, a lot of those BPAs are in partnership with large companies and, and all the way down to small business. And so, small, um, depending on what your requirements are, you know, you can leverage some of these some of these BPAs out there for some very large requirements. The Army, for example, is leveraging DOs, uh, and and looking at you know. Um, that's a very large community of folks moving into DOD 365 or Office 365, if you will. Um, but but then there are small business providers on um, some of our blanket BPAs for um, laptops and mobility equipment, right? Um, and you can do small purchase orders, that sort of thing. So I think there's some diversity in that. The other thing I'd chime in on is, you know, the department has um, began to leverage more and more of other acquisition authorities that they hadn't done in the past. And um, and that's bringing in some of that development space, um, some of those smaller projects, as Chris was talking about, the opportunity to do some um, some uh, prototyping and, and that, that kind of work. So that's really been very helpful as well. And, and there's a good news story just this year, this last year, as we moved into the pandemic, we, the department really quickly um, went out and acquired um, CVR, which is the you know the uh, collaboration suite that we used for um, teams and that sort of thing, and and there was something over like over a million people using that, and and they did that acquisition in less than 90 days, um, so um, it you know it it's gotten a lot faster. Something like that in the past would have taken you know the couple years that we we were used to, but we went out and we bought a collaboration suite to help the department during the pandemic, and we did it in less than ninety days. And it's I think that shows that there's progress. Do you think that that's uh, something you'll do again? Was this a one-off to meet an emergency need, or do you think that you know, the way you did that can be a model for the way you do things in the future? I think it certainly proved a point that in case in times of contingency support, when it's really needed, um, I think we had very similar acquisitions across the department as we went to war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, we went from zero to you know deploying troops in a very short period of time. Tons of acquisitions done in those very early days that were were rapid um, acquisitions. Um, so we can do it when it's absolutely necessary. I think. Um, there's always a risk, you know, the faster you go, you, you, you know, there's a possibility that you forget something. Um, so there's a, there's a point, there's a point in time to, to, to the fast and there's a point in time to do the deliberate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then there's a, you know, a point in time when you look at, you know, what you've got good that's worked small and, and how, you know, how do you make it better? Um, I was struck, I was talking to a, a former Navy captain the other day, and he was bemoaning the fact that on the destroyers, there are six different bridge setups. And, you know, each one, I'm sure, was an innovation that somebody thought was a good idea. And each one is, is starting to, you know, serve, you know, serve trying to do some aspect of Navy operations better, but you have the, then the problem that the people who man it are come onto a new destroyer, expect it to operate one way, and they don't. Can you talk a little bit, uh, Christopher, about how you take, you know, the good ideas that function on a small scale and, you know, decide which ones, you know, should be pushed across uh, Stacy's Valley of Death and, and, you know, wind up as something that, that Jeff is trying to introduce across the whole Pentagon? Yeah, so that's one of the reasons why why we hire uh, designers uh, with a, a deep expertise in user experience uh, research. Um, when we are confronted with with the, with the technology problem and we do these discovery sprints, um, the our UX researchers will ask a bunch a bunch of questions, almost to the point where sometimes they think we're silly for asking all these questions, but in undergoing that process, it lets us get a good handle on what are the needs of the user, what things really work for them, what things drive them absolutely crazy, and and what stuff is just kind of annoying to them. And in working those um, insights from that discovery res discovery sprint and our user research, we can build a product that we know works. Um, and 
because we're working in sort of this iterative agile way, we are able to to change a small thing, see if it works out better. And then at the end of the day, we have something that, that we're really proud of that's that's supremely easy to use and not only be it for a small team, but that can scale up to a bunch of users as well. Uh, can you give some examples of stuff that, that's really worked out well that way? Sure. So one of the one of the things that that we did at the start of the pandemic was the my status um, application. Uh, it first started as one of these rapid response things when uh, we had the the COVID outbreak on the Theodore Roosevelt, but the team went in there and talked to to medical personnel, um, to sailors, to to sort of understand what they were trying to do with that application, both from sort of I'm the the medical officer on the ship my job is to to make sure everyone stays healthy what information do i need to to better triage to talking with the actual users of the app who have nothing to do with medical they're just expected to to fill this out and we were very very quickly able to roll out an app that we're now scaling out uh, across the department and to not only other navy ships but but other other units as well Fascinating. There actually is an app for that. Um, so, Stacy, what you know, you you were just talking about the Valley of Death. What what's you know, how from from your standpoint, what are the challenges of bringing something from a smaller scale to a, a larger one? Um, well, I what I wanted to say about scale is sort of pointing out some of the reasons that you have a diversity of systems and um, a diversity in terms of the type of software, the types of clouds and what you're seeing across uh, the department, because each of the services is pursuing its own solutions. And it's largely because they are dissimilar in really important ways. And one of them scale for the army. It's so much larger. It needs to have every soldier that has some sort of system much of the time, which is very different than the Air Force and the number of aircraft and uh, weapon systems that it has. And that is introducing um, differences in terms of their requirements and why they are using different uh, cloud computing architectures and um, hoping that they are planning. I, I, they've reached an agreement and plan that the their clouds are going to speak to each other and the data is going to work at that, that level. But they're each going to have their own separate technical architecture because they just have very, very different requirements. And you have seen in a recent um, episode of uh, a system that has um, passed through the valley of death and survived. Um, it was just announced that Microsoft is going to be providing the army with these new um, goggles, the integrated visual augmentation system, which is basically to me sounds like a heads up display for soldiers where they can see a bunch of information um, in glasses that they're wearing, including uh, global, posi global positioning information, terrain information, navigations, so they'll be able to communicate. I think it's gonna let them see at night. Um, all of these cool things integrated into one little system and they're supposed to be purchasing 40,000 of these and connecting the soldiers through the cloud to each other. So. That that's a, something that seems to be going well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how about you, Jeff? I'll let you weigh on this as well. Um, the you know how how does DISA uh, you know find small things or or welcome you know small scale things and 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 usher them into the big time, so to speak. Our focus in in terms of scale and and folks um, going off and finding their own small thing is it's been joint interoperability. Um, you know, in the cloud instances, for example, everybody needs identity. Um, you know, some identity feeds that for authentication and and to put in their email uh, services, um, and even for their applications. And so, having a, a global federated identity service that everyone can leverage regardless of where they go lends to that interoperability so so folks can go out uh, you know the army and, and the air force can have different cloud instances to meet what stacy was talking about their their very specific mission requirements um, but then they still are sharing um, the same identity um, information and um, and that helps and that helps in the joint environments as well as an army and an air force folk you know, leave their home units and go down range and operate, you know, in, in that capacity, their identity um, sort of follows them regardless of where they exist, you know, in the cloud, if you will. 
Um, so that's really been our, our focus is really trying to keep the inter interoperability and to help customers um, on the cloud backside do that federation piece. Mm -hmm. Same thing with mobility. All right, uh, viewers, listeners, uh, in, in about six or seven minutes, we'll go to your questions. Thank you for those who've been putting them in the Q&A. Um, I want to talk, so uh, put more in there and we'll get to them. Um, one more question from me. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about the uh, what it would take to get the services share back and forth. And, and Stacy, it was a thank you very much for explaining why the different services require different architectures. You know, there is a reason for things to be slightly different, but you also need to share stuff, and that's going to take better standards for for data organization and sharing, and um, a better way to do, I think, permissions. Um, can you can uh, folks talk about that a little bit? Sure, I'm happy to. I mean, one of the big unanswered questions right now with all of these um, projects that are looking at uh, multi-domain operations is authorities. Um, right now, each service normally has authority or the operational commander, the joint task force commander, the COCOM commander, when forces are deployed to um, test different um, systems and they own that information and uh, share it with each other only, you know, if command has been transferred and they're going to have to determine um, how they are going to share information and make it more readily available to everyone if they actually need it. They're going to need to do so to actually have the AI um, for it to have enough information to be processing things and learning what they wanted to so they can make better decisions. And they're going to have to, in terms of integrating all of these different forces, they can't just hold on to um, what they control right now. And I don't think that they have um, begun to sort of figure out how that how that's going to work. Um, what do you see of that sort of thing, Christopher? Yeah, this is in in a number of of, of of discovery sprints we've looked at the the fact that we have so many different systems between the different service plants and the defense agencies causes just a huge issue particularly when we, they weren't designed from the beginning to talk to each other mm -hmm. um it it's going to come down to at the end of the day who wants to take ownership of the data which means certain responsibilities over making sure it's clean, it's accurate, and can talk to each to other systems. I um, this is one of those things where you might have the suggestion, oh well, let's create a new super system to to take over everything, and that has potential for for IT risk because it's one of those big huge procurements. So it's. Um, something that I think we'll have to take sort of a, a more slow, methodical approach than than what I would like. But given sort of the the number of different systems, that's it's just going to be something painful that we have to to chip away at. I'm reminded of a of a comic by um, uh, by Randall Monroe XKCD in which uh, somebody gets together and says, two people get together and say, okay, there's 16 different standards for this data. Uh, you know, we need, we need a 17th standard, you know, and <laughs> then, then you're, you're not really solving the problem. Okay. Uh, let us go to some audience Q and a, and this first question, um, I think gets to the heart of security. Um, the, the question that I think a lot of people have, um, especially following, you know, the solar winds and some other big hacks. Uh, the question is we've gone to the cloud, but why does it seem we are getting so many successful hacks and malware exposures that affect seemingly millions of us at a time? Why is the cloud a better way? Uh, who is leading and, and trying to get more secure ways to connect us all? Uh, Jeff, you wanna you wanna start yeah. with that one? Yeah. So, you know, in using uh, more COTS products or commercial products out there doesn't mean more or less security. I, I, I you know, we we had challenges back in in the day with um, a lot of the government developed systems. I think the way that we get um, better at that, faster at that, is through programs like the Bug Bounty Program and the Vulnerability Disclosure Program and working with our defense industrial base partners um, in terms of sharing information. Um, cyber information sharing uh, and bringing in AI, like, like through DISIS Jake, um, the, you know, I think is really kind of where we get after it. Um, 
having a commercial um, product is is no different than any other piece of software. It's going to have its own set of risks. And, um, you know, I think back to 10 or 15 years ago when the SQL worm was, was going around and it was one of the biggest worms at the time, um, SQL products everywhere. Um, were vulnerable to it. The Department of Defense had SQL servers that were part of that, but we weren't alone. There were also commercial partners out there that had had that vulnerability. We so I think you're going to still have those events. Um, the um, I don't think the way to go is to cut yourself off from the commercial industry and say, well, because there's risk out there, we don't engage. Instead, we go we we go into this together, right? We're partners now, and, and um, I think we're we're making a lot of progress in in that in that area. Mm -hmm. Chris, I see you not Christopher, I see you nodding. Yeah, definitely. One of the, the ideas uh, that I think has a lot of merit is this idea of working vulnerability disclosure and uh, sort of forcing new systems to go through some form of vulnerability testing or, or pen testing before they go online as part of the, the acquisition process. Um, like there's there's a reason why uh, Army units go to the National Training Center. It's because you really don't know how things are going to go until you you red team them a little bit. And I think in in doing that, that um, helps expose a lot of vulnerabilities, which we can then close, versus having them out there for our adversaries to take care of. I'd much rather uh, pay a security researcher a bounty than than find out about a vulnerability the hard way. Right, and and I. I think a lot of people have talked about uh, you know vulnerability testing, the bug bounties, and that sort of thing. And it you know it seems like a great idea. Uh, on the other hand, you also you know need to build security in, and I think build it in you know more now than ever. Uh, doesn't that slow things down? And and you know how do you how do you build vulnerability into the the development process so that it doesn't slow everything down to a crawl? Or sorry, not vulnerability. How do you build you know security considerations into the into the development process? Uh, I can take Stacey part of that. One. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah. one of the things that we we do at DDS is we we try to bring on uh, cybersecurity talent uh, to to help us think through these things as we're building products or evaluating uh, different solutions for things. Um, in fact, we actually uh, borrowed a master sergeant from from DISA to to do just that. He uh, is a security researcher. Um, and he's helping us improve our uh, hack the Pentagon program and, and doing some work on our protective DNS. Um, the I think there's definitely work to be done in making it easier to hire uh, cybersecurity professionals, not only in uh, the Department of Defense, but across uh, federal and both state and local government. Um, I think the um, we we make hiring a little bit too complicated. Um, it's it's is a great time to to join government, um, so I'll I'll throw in a plug that that we're always accepting applications, but I think that's part of how we do that is we make sure we have cybersecurity professionals working alongside us as we start to build out our products and design our systems. Hmm. Stacy, I think you wanted to say something a little while ago. Oh, I was just going to say, um, I, I have some concerns, the fact that these connect everything ideas are creating a huge attack surface, essentially, that um, is just something that adversaries are certainly going to look to see if they can find vulnerabilities in. And in particular with AI and machine learning, um, Georgetown recently, uh, its Center for Security and Emerging Technology had a report on AI and ML and just said that they were riddled with vulnerabilities. And since we don't always understand why the algorithms make certain decisions, it's even harder. So it's, it's definitely a tough problem. Um, but there's also the other piece of it is that we're planning and preparing to operate in a way that is highly interconnected and adversaries have non cyber ways of disrupting that such as jamming, you know, cutting cables and that we may be relying on these communications and these uh, networks and find that they're not available when they're most needed going back to your other. Uh, point earlier where you go back to sort of, sort of more manual ways of um, operating and doing so in a distributed fashion. And so is that, you know, the Army as well, there have been, you know, generals here and there that pop up and say, you know, I always make my troops use maps, you know, for a portion of the, the exercise. They got to actually, you know, pull the paper out. 
Um, Jeff, were you weighing in there as well on the on the idea of, of building security in from the very start? Yeah, I, you know, I think it's interesting now in the acquisition process, we put a lot of more of those requirements up front. I think the other piece that uh, Chris talked about is building a better cyber workforce. Um, we, we've done so much more in terms of training and building out um, cyber protection teams that can do some of that upfront analysis for us. But, you know, the other thing I would say is, is that there is some resiliency that we get from moving to cloud and virtualized and mobile systems um, to, to the extent that you get a decentralized um, footprint. And so um, it's not, you, you don't just go right to the castle and just keep pounding on the wall. You have to go to a lot of different castles now. And um, and then the other thing is through virtualization, that sort of thing, recovery is so much faster. You know, if we get, if something gets owned, we can quickly isolate it and then, uh, you know, or even take it offline and spin up another instance of it over here. Um, we've done patching on CVR in real time and had less operational risk for that. Um, and so, um, there's there's a lot of goodness from a cyber perspective and resiliency in in some of this new environment as well. It's not all it's not all bad risk, but but Stacy's right in the sense that um, as we begin to decentralize, the interoperability needs grow. Right, you have more connections between places, and that every connection makes another opportunity. So I think we have to be mindful of that as well. Okay, uh, here's another question from the audience, and I think uh, this is at least tangentially related to Christopher's talking about bringing people on. The question is, is the insider threat? That would be people who are, you know, troops or or military uh, or, or DoD employees or, or contractors. Are they still our biggest vulnerability? What are we doing to move that uh, down the risk priority, given that we seem to be opening up the military and government to more applicants? Insider threat. Yeah, so I think, you know, the, the, the development of systems over time has made information um, a little easier to share. But on the same, in the same hand, um, I think the security has gotten a lot better. We have two-factor authentication. We have, um, you know, virtualized instances of the data, better controls, I think, on the data. Um, you know, at any point in history, you're going to have an expansion and a, and a contraction of the workforce. Um, but I don't know that necessarily the insider threat is our largest threat um, from an information space uh, problem. Um, I, I would have to, you know, research that a little more to be sure. But but I would say that generally we have better um, from from an individual user perspective, I think we have better controls than we had even 10 years ago when the predominance of things was username and passwords, right? Um, and people could get into systems a little more more easily. There's a whole lot more encryption too. You know, just about every device is, is now capable of encryption, encryption at rest. And, and so I think that helps as well. Okay, uh, here's another question. Um, both health and logistics use unclassified or commercial networks to successfully connect to civilian agencies. Um, but, says the questioner, they've always been the long pole in the security effort. Uh, with COVID and increased humanitarian ops, how are we improving that weakness in the DOD communications infrastructure? I like this because it's kind of an edge case. It's not what maybe we typically think of when we're talking about, you know, connecting the battlefield or whatever. Um, but any thoughts about it? We've definitely um, seen, or I've seen some of this in uh, war games where there've been creative teams that attempt to go after the parts of the system that are on the civilian side and not on a um, classified network. And those uh, nodes where they cross over are particularly vulnerable. Um, but we've also find that um, at least on the logistics side, which is the one that I've looked at more closely, the system is um, somewhat of a robust one uh, because there are often a lot of glitches in it. So there are a lot of fail safes built in. They double check the data when, when units are getting ready to deploy, when they um, go somewhere, they have to have their list. And there are so many, it's very common for there to be errors in those that they are frequently double checked in a manual way. So the automated uh, nature of the system isn't sort of the only thing that people are relying on. Like we see when, you know, one of the commercial airlines system goes down and everything stops and all flights halt for a day. 
Um, so there's a little bit of robustness that's built in there, but you can imagine that if we become more and more uh, digitized and reliant on that and some of those manual backups aren't used, that it would be a big problem. Mm -hmm. All right. I also think that's, oh, go, sorry. No, 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 Christopher, go ahead. I also think that speaks to sort of the importance of the role that CISA plays. Um, and DDS got to work with, with CISA on a number of projects uh, in relation to sort of the pandemic response, and they're fantastic to work with. And um, I think going forward, uh, making sure that we maintain those good partnerships between sort of the defense agencies and CISA, who has more of the civilian infrastructure and and sort of their lane, I think is also important moving forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I will tell you from DISA's perspective, so DLA and, and DHA, um, um, Defense Health Agency, both big um, partners with us, they challenge us quite frequently because they do have different information demands and they have a, a broad footprint globally and they have a um, broad interface with industry on the logistics side. They're, they're, you know, ships, planes, trains, all of those commodity transport systems. And then on the health side, patient records and patient uh, interaction. A anytime you need something from the patient or you have to uh, transmit information back and forth between hospitals and pharmacies, those kinds of things, you have those, um, those risks. Um, but those kinds of things um, over time, I think have gotten better, and it's through partnerships like that, um, challenging ourselves. If you really want to see in defense innovation, you go look at the logistics and health uh, communities. They're leading in the innovation space, and and their integration with industry standards and industry controls, I think, is part of that. That's fascinating. Um, can you talk about a few things that you think that maybe the rest of the the DoD edifice could learn from the health and logistics folks? Well, I think they know their data much better than our average uh, partners. They know um, where their data is, how it's stored and secured. I think that's an important part. They know their requirements better. Um, um, and I think the other thing is, is that um, they're some of the first communities that pilot new initiatives. So they, they work very closely with commercial companies and, and bring in um, uh, new ideas earlier on. Um, and, and they pilot them and put them through the rigor. Um, and so then they're moving at the speed of industry in, in some of those cases. You know, if you ask DLA on any given day where a certain piece of equipment is that they manage, they can tell you. And that is phenomenal given their footprint. Um, and it's, um, it's those kinds of systems, um, you know, DLA, for example, is one of the first major uh, defense organizations that's going to move their ERP to the cloud. Um, and so, and it's because they lean forward, they partner with industry, um, and, uh, you know, they, I think that's kind of where we're going with as, as a department overall. All right. Well, you heard it here, uh, folks, go talk to the health and logistics groups and see what they're doing. Uh, okay. Well, we're getting near the end of our time here. Um, is there, are there other things that you think uh, we ought to mention um, before we, uh, before we go? Um, Stacy, do you want to talk? You want to start? I know we've just barely, you know, scraped the surface. So, so much, only so much you can do in an hour, but I uh, want to let everybody get their last lick in. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, that we've seen a lot of progress in these different areas in terms of finding um, different innovative acquisition authorities and uh, models to try to uh, meet the requirements to more rapidly acquire and be able to actually deploy um, software and technology, but uh, that there remains a lot to be done. And part of this is going to actually be explaining the challenges and the new requirements to those on the Hill. Um, you've seen that the Air Force has run into a lot of problems with its ABMS system and trying to do sort of a rapid uh, acquisition and prototyping and improving over time, uh, more like the software industry and that the Hill hasn't really adapted to that and accepted that they haven't uh, filled out all the required paperwork and done all of the analysis that they want up front. Um, so that, that that's part of the process that's going to have to happen more broadly if this is going to scale to uh, big defense uh, weapon systems in addition to um, just the, the software that they're using day to day. 
Well, that of course is a great point. Uh, uh, you need to you need to let the folks who are controlling the money know exactly what you're doing, and if they have questions, to to let them let them let them figure it out or help them figure it out. Uh, Jeff, I'll go to you for the last word, and then finally for to Christopher. Um, what do you think, Jeff? Yeah, so I think it's really a great time to be working in in um, defense. You know, we have traditionally been last to the party when it comes to IT. Um, we're slow adopters. We're not comfortable with um, the risks that that introduces. And I, I, uh, that really has changed quite a bit um, in, in recent years. Um, we're, we're moving out. Um, we're partnering with industry. And um, there's, I think, you know, the thing we've got to keep um, in the front of our minds is um, Avoiding it or, or procrastinating on it doesn't make the problem better. So, so leaning in, um, partnering, um, and staying connected with folks, I think, is really the, the way forward. And that, and yep. that, that I think, is the there. posture. To, yep. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and Christopher, last word. Yeah, so I'll I'll sort of reiterate what what Jeff said. It's it's a great time to to join public service, um, if you have listened in and found these problems to be really really interesting, and you have um, the skills to help help solve it. Um, come check us out at dds.mil/join. Um, particularly if you're uh, currently a service member um, with a technical background that that might be interested in in a detail, uh, come reach out. It's my very good oh. plug for today. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Okay. Well, uh, Stacy Pettijohn of the Center for New American Security, Jeff Van Bemmel of DISA, and Christopher Whitaker of DDS. Thank you so much for joining us. And of course, uh, everybody watching this, uh, listening to it, thank you for tuning in. This has been the fourth Tech Talk of Defense One. We hope you'll join us uh, for more events in the future. And of course, come check out our website morning, noon, and night. Take care, everybody. Thank you. all